Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for listening to the best Houston sports podcast. Well, the Houston Cougars in college football lost a legend this week. Coach Bill Yeoman passed away at age 92. From 1962 to 1986, he coached U of H to 11 bowl games. His resume includes 46 All-Americans, 69 NFL players, inventor of the Veer offense, most wins in UH history, nine-time nominee for National Coach of the Year, and an inductee to the College Football Hall of Fame. Joining me to remember Coach Yeoman is former voice of the Houston Cougars, Tom Franklin, and also on the line is one of Coach Yeoman's best players, an all-SWC running back, honorable All-American, the 1977 Cotton Bowl MVP in the Cougars' 30-21 win over an undefeated Maryland team, and a former Dallas Cowboy as well, A. Lois Blackwell. Thank you both for taking the time to do this, and let me start off with you, A. Lois. What was it like to play for Coach Yeoman? What made him so special? Well, the fact, I think, that he invented the veer, and you always want to play for someone that uh, that did accomplish something like that because the veer at the time was a, was a new type of offense, very explosive, and then – being a running back, you wanted to be somewhere where they, they didn't mind giving you the ball to run with. Tom, you were introduced to Coach Yeoman as a fan when you were just a student in the early to mid-70s. What do you remember about those times? Well, I, I just remember the teams being highly successful, and uh, it was one of the reasons that, uh, that Houston was my school of choice when I was coming out of high school in 1970. Is you know Not only did it have to have a great broadcasting department, which – U of H did at the time, but to me, being a sports fan, it also had to have great football and basketball teams. And you got Bill Yeoman and Guy Lewis running your football and basketball programs there. You don't get much better than that. So that was part of the attraction for me to go 1,500 miles away from home to to go to college was to watch these guys. You know, I'd, I'd gotten at that time to see them play in some Blue Mountain Bowl games, and they were exciting to watch back then. And uh, it was that beer offense that A. Lewis was talking mm-hmm. about that was different than anybody else was running that made them so spectacular. Yeah, I want to go back to the Veer in a a bit, but, uh, you know, he was an innovator in so many ways. He was the first head coach, uh, head football coach at a major Texas program to offer a scholarship to an African-American when he brought in Warren McVay, literally changing college football in the South. What did it mean to you back then, A. Lois, as an African-American, and was it something that you thought about when you signed with the Cougars? I really didn't think about that at the time, and but, but I, uh, when we came in, that was the largest class. The 73 class was the largest class of African Americans that they had ever brought there in 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 a recruiting class. So it was it was 12 of us out of the uh, out of the 30 that was recruited or that signed. And it was a lot of competition. It was a lot of competition. Coach Hillman had a lot of good people in all positions, and so it was very competitive. And it was very you know. A lot of hard work. Tom Wilson was a very integral part of that program. And then hiring uh, Coach Red as the uh, running back coach, you know, that uh, was was something that was rare, bringing a black coach in at a predominantly white school. So he was innovative in, you know, several areas. Did you get a chance to talk to him about those times and what, you know, what that team had to endure back then in the 60s, including the death threats and, and whatever else? You know, Coach Hillman was the kind of guy that when he made up his mind about doing something and he believed that it was right, and he was a Christian person, and he exemplified that in his leadership as a coach. And so if he believed that something was right and that uh, it fit into his Christian values, uh, he proceeded along with that. And so I think some of those things gave him strength and courage in regards to facing some opposition that I'm sure that we will never know about. Tom, as a kid from... Upper, you know, Upper New York, Buffalo, New York. How much did you understand about the magnitude and courage that Yeoman had in integrating the Houston program when you came to Houston? I really didn't have a great concept of it when I got here because things were different from where I lived to where it was down here. Seeing African American players on the field for U of H was no big deal to me. It wasn't until after I got here that I really started to absorb what he really did when he brought Warren McVeigh and that class into the U of H. And, uh, and, and looking back, one of the things that, that, that stood out to me was uh, when he was first asked about this sort of thing, he was at some sort of gathering and uh, Coach Hillman said, one of his statements was, he says, I am prejudiced. 
and it took people by by surprise for a moment. But he says, "I'm prejudiced against bad football players," and that <laughs> and, and that suddenly changed anything. And and that told you right then and there that Billy Yeoman didn't care where you came from, where you grew up, what your background was, what you looked like. If you could play football, then you were good enough to play for him. Hey, Lewis, you mentioned that Veer offense, and I, I want to get your just thoughts on what made it so dangerous, and, and how did Coach explain it to you, if he did, about what's going to make it work and, and how you guys are going to run it? The thing that really made it work was uh, the fact that you had to be quick. I mean, because when, when you actually look at it, uh, back when I was there, the offensive linemen were probably maybe about 10 or 20 pounds more than what I actually weighed. So uh, I had uh, Spradlin and Rolich on my side of the, on my side of the ball. Uh, they weighed maybe 235 pounds and 200, maybe 30 pounds. So it was quick. You had to get to your, your blocking point and you had to at least shade the guy enough so where the back could get through. And then from that standpoint, it was more so reading the defense and the flow of the defense in regards to how you actually uh, ran the offense. And you had to have a good quarterback. Danny Davis was an excellent quarterback at the time. And, uh, I mean, we had a tremendous defense. Uh, the defensive side of the ball was just, you know, with Coach Todd anchoring that as the coach. I mean, it, it was a tremendous side of the ball. You had Wilson Whitley, All-American on that side. You had Anthony Francis. Vincent Greenwood, Guy Brown, and and everybody challenged each other. It was a it was a challenge. I mean, so when you came off the field on an offensive unit, and you really wasn't getting the ball done, the defensive unit was talking to you a little bit, you know. So you didn't necessarily want to hear that. So you 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 worked hard, and we were recruited in '73 to come in and win the conference. That was the whole concept behind the the, the recruiting class that came in in '73 was that we was going to win the conference. And we was going to win and we was going to go to the Cotton Bowl and we was going to win the Cotton Bowl. So that's the thing that we focused on throughout the three years that it took us to get to that point and win. The year prior to that in 75, we went two and eight. But the fact of it is we had a lot of guys that had never played again, such as myself, played that much. But we came back and we stayed true to what we came there to do, win the conference and the, and the championship. And then the other thing that I think that it opened up nationally, which hadn't happened, was the fact that. We were preseason pick number six in the nation. UCLA was preseason pick number five, and they moved the game from Saturday to Monday night. And we were the University of Houston and UCLA was the second team ever to play on Monday night football. And we were able to uh, beat UCLA. I think the score was like 19 to 16. And that was a tremendous feat for the University of Houston. What kind of presence was Coach Yeoman in the locker room, Alois? Uh, pre-game, halftime moments. So what do you remember about you know, just him and his presence and, and you know, the big moments, uh, what was he like? Well, uh, Coach Elman was the kind of guy that you had to, you need to stay focused on what you needed to do. And if he seemed some type of distraction from that, uh, you could be on a bus or a plane back home. So that pretty much summed it up on what, how his focus was. He was pretty serious about what he did. But even though Coach Inman was really serious, most of the time he really had a witty sense of humor. Very, very different, very distinct. And, and the language that he used was flapping or something when he gets like excited about something or wanted to describe something. He would come up with these words that I can't even pronounce right now. But, but they were always unique words and they were something that you normally don't hear people say but they were always real flattering and funny to me when he said it. So, And people don't remember maybe that he was a hell of a player himself as an offensive lineman at Army, he blocked for Heisman winners Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis, played for and coached with the great coach uh, Red Blake and was on a staff with Vince Lombardi. Hey, Lois, did he ever mention either of them or, or tell any stories about those days? Uh, Duffy Darty all the time, all the time. All the time. Matter of fact, Duffy, he brought Duffy down uh, several times in regards to speaking with the team. But no, his Michigan State uh, experience, he shared that on a regular basis. Those were, were part, of his, part of his speeches. Tom, is there a, a memorable game or two from Coach Yeoman's career for you personally? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, I, I think you have to go back. You know, A. Lois will know them well. Those Cotton Bowl games where, where the team got there right at the start after, you know, the Southwest Conference made Houston wait six years to be eligible to play after admitting them to the Southwest Conference. 
and then the Cougars go in there and and go to the Cotton Bowl. Was, was it three of three of the first four years? Two or three, at least two of the first three. But but to see those teams have the payoff that they did at that particular point in time was incredible to watch. And then you know everybody will always remember uh, the Joe Montana Notre Dame game up in the Cotton Bowl and. The, the late comeback and did he catch the two point uh, conversion at the end because you couldn't see the sideline from the cameras yeah. or not and you had to trust the, the the referees call that it was good for the two point conversion and that that cotton bowl game that got away you know those are some of the, the highlights for for my Billy Oman eras for sure what about you Lois what, what what sticks out for you I mean you had the, that great season huge win over Texas was it 30 to nothing I think something like that it, it was 30 to nothing. And I'll tell you one thing, if we'd still be playing right now, it's, it, they would still have zero. So, and, <laughs> unfortunately, 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 my son went to school there. So, uh, but uh, and so he, if he hears this, he's going to have some objections to that. But uh, no, I, I'll tell you, you know, like a personal story in regards to it. Uh, when we, we started two a days for the year that uh, the 76 season that we was going to go to the Cotton Bowl. So I had a uh, hamstring somewhat pull. So I really wasn't practicing as much. And so right before the season got ready to start the week of, I got moved from first team to second team. Okay, so then we took the bus. And we took the bus down to Waco to play Baylor, which was going to be our first Southwest Conference game. And on the way down from Baylor to get to the hotel, I go from from second team, I'm third team now. And so just off of a bus ride, I go from I go from first team, second team to third team. And so we, but we still went out and we beat Baylor. Uh, I think it was 23 to five. And then, but then we went down to Florida and we got just demolished. I mean, we, we it was like 48 to 14, something like that. And then I started playing. And then I, I, I started starting again and, and then we didn't lose another game except when we played Arkansas. But th- that was, uh, that's how he got your attention sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a, a worse bus ride than Keanu Reeves had in speed there. But, <laughs> uh, and Lois, what kind of uh, presence in your life was coach after you finished playing for him? Well, we always communicated. We played golf together. We talked on the phone. As a matter of fact, I've gone to visit him over at the assisted living facility off of Woodway. And we, we always kept a good relationship. I mean, Coach Elman was a very good part of my life. You know, uh, we accomplished some great things together. And so it, we always had a great relationship. How much of a presence, Tom, was he at U of H uh, after his retirement? Huge, huge. His presence was always felt. And in the three years that I worked for the Alumni Association, Lois was there for part of that thing. One of the best things that could ever happen would be walking through the halls and run into coach. And sometimes coach would be there with his, his late love of his life, AJ, and the two of them would be there. And, and those conversations that would spur up no matter where you were, were some of the best that you would have. Oftentimes, the coach would start the conversation with something to do with football, but it would always merge into life. And the things that you talked about with Coach Yeoman and, things, and you talked about life with Coach Yeoman are the things that you always remember. Do you feel like those coaches that followed him were still going to him for advice? Absolutely. If they weren't, they were silly because he was a yeah. font of knowledge. And and if, if they didn't take the time to seek out Coach Yeoman and run some things by him, they were just wasting their own time and not being the very best coaches they could be because he was, and Alois could tell you better than anybody, he was a tremendous resource when it came to football. And let me just add uh, a, a couple of other things to what Tom is saying, because that's exactly the truth. I mean, Coach Hellman very quietly kept, but, oh, there was a there was quite a few schools right here in Texas and nationally that were coming and professionally that came to him and wanted him to uh, be the head coach and offered him way, way more money than what he was making at the University of Houston, but he always turned it down. He turned it down because he said that's where he wanted to be. He wanted to be at Houston, and he was committed. He was the kind of guy that, you know, once he made a commitment, you know, and signed a contract, he was a guy that honored his contract. It wasn't a guy that, hey, he was going looking for another job. As soon as he could get another, another offer, he was gone. So, you know, that's rare right now. You don't really find that, but uh, he was that type of person. And so, but no, he had many opportunities to leave the University of Houston and go coach other places. 
How often would you talk to Amay Lewis over the years? Was it pretty frequently? We at least touch bases at least once every couple of months we touch bases and then towards the latter part we touch bases a lot uh, uh, you know a lot more it just depends on what was going on but you could always find him at the country club uh playing golf in the morning you know he he that's one place you could always <laughs> find him he was going to be there playing golf so this one's kind of for both of you is there a story that sums up who coach yeoman was or how you'll most remember him let me start off with you tom oh golly uh, I don't know where I, where I would even start. It's just the impression that he leaves you with. The thing is, is that whoever you were, and I, and I saw this in many different occasions, but if you were talking to Coach Yeoman, you were the most important person in the world at that particular point in time to him. He made it a point to be face-to-face, eye contact, deeply involved with whatever it was. It could be nonsensical. It could be dead serious. It could be somewhere in between. But you were the most important thing at the time. He always had time for somebody. If somebody sought him out for some reason, whatever it was, he always had time for them, was always gracious, was always forthcoming. That's how I remember Coach, is that you know he showed you how, what it was to be an honorable person, is the, is the best way I could put it. Uh, he was he was the very, very best at doing that. And if, if he was important enough to you to go see him, you were important enough to him to take the time out and take care of whatever it was that you came to him with. Tom pretty much summed it up. I mean, it's it's the same story. Uh, if you know him, it's, it, the story doesn't change. Uh, the narrative is the same in regards to how he was. He was like I said, he was he had Christian values. He exemplified those Christian values, both with his family, with his players, and his commitments. And so those are the things that I remember most about him, and I think those are the things that actually made him the type of coach that he was and accomplished the things that he accomplished. Were there sayings, A. Lois, that you remember from him and you find yourself repeating or sort of trying to live out in your daily life? This one saying that he would say, if you, if people that didn't come to maybe miss practice or something or had excuses about not showing up at practice he would say out of sight out of mind so if he didn't see you he was out of sight and he was out of the mind so you know it's things like it's things like that that uh he he would always say and flapping was one of his other major words that he would use but uh, coach Elman was he was entertaining he really was in inter- he really did have a sense of humor he and, did and and most people don't really think that, but then I, I, I saw him and, you know, when I first came to U of H and I met his wife, Alicia, I was like, he had to have something because she was a beautiful lady. And so I know that he had to, <laughs> had to have something else other than football in regards to being able to have her, you know, so, uh, but, but he had a sense of humor and coach Elma could dance. Very few people really realize that he was an excellent dancer. Yeah, that's something I haven't heard much about. Tommy, did you know about this? <laughs> I, I did not know that he would that he could cut a rug. No, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ask Bill Jr. He 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 can he can verify that. He no, he uh, I, I I'm 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 sure he could. I'm sure he could. Alan, uh, I I don't know how he was in the locker room, but but uh, I never heard him utter a profanity. He had sayings, but they were never profane. Was that the way he was? And that's what I'm saying. He had these unique words where a person would utter a profanity that he would use those words like flapping. I I, I can't think of the the different words that he would come up with. Right. Yeah, I'll I'll give you guys one story that that stands out in my mind from my early days at KTRH. Uh, At that time, before he became a big TV star, Jim Nance worked at KTRH as well. And Jim was doing sportscasts as well on KTRH. And one of Coach Yeoman's phrases was "my stars." You remember that? Yeah, the, my stars. Just, yeah, just, 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 just my, just my stars. And he's going through his his sportscast, and at the end of every sentence of every story, 
It was like, you know, it was so, you know, the, the, the Astros lost the Dodgers seven to four, my stars, you know, so-and-so hit three home runs, my stars with the whole sports cast was a, my stars sports cast. And we're all rolling on the floor and the sports office says, Jim is playing this thing out. And I will never forget the, my stars sports cast. But you're right, Tom. That was one of his, that was another favorite uh, saying of his, my stars. He'd say that in a minute. Well, these are some great memories, guys. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing some of this stuff. And it, it just, you know, it feels like an end of an era, really, uh, for, for Houston Cougar football in, in a lot of ways this week. In a lot yeah, of ways it is, but, but, but Coach Yeoman's going to live on for a long, long time. And Aloes will definitely back that up, I'm sure. Without a doubt. Uh, and uh, as soon as we can get through this, I, I was talking to Bill Jr. Uh, uh, yesterday. And as soon as we kind of get through this pandemic, I mean, we'll we'll be able to do something officially to be able to represent him in the way that he should be represented at both at the University of Houston and all his players and, and fans and people that have been uh, a part of his program throughout the year. So hopefully we can get through this and uh, and do something really monumental for him. Uh, he is certainly deserving of that, and we need to get to a time to where we can honor him properly. Absolutely, guys, and I can't think – both of you enough for doing this. We're not done yet with Bill Yeoman memories, though, because joining me now is one of Coach Yeoman's recruiting coordinators from back in the 70s. From 1975 to 1980, Butch Gutzman was head of recruiting in one of Coach Yeoman's best eras of football at the University of Houston. Thanks for doing this. Hey, pr- proud to do it. Uh, love the man, and uh, thank you for doing it for Coach Yeoman. Well, first of all, let me just get your, your memories. When I, when I tell you Coach Yeoman, when I say his name, what do you think of? Well, it was a time where Bill, Bill Yeoman was 47 years old when he hired me, and I was 26. He was like a father figure to me, just like he was to the players, even though I had an important role in, in, uh, in his program. And by the way, my background is baseball. I played baseball at Texas A&M and, and not football, so – to show you his iron will and everything, he had uh, heard about me and, and I had been recommended and everything. He tricked me on a plane and uh, convinced me to kind of break my Aggie bond because I was an A&M player and, and come to work for him. And he turned the recruiting over to me and I asked him the question. I said, Coach, are you sure you want to do that with a guy with no football background, over 50-year-old men that have been lifers in football? And he said, you let me worry about that. It took a lot of courage on both of our parts, really, to be honest with you. But uh, he was a father figure to me. There's no question about that. And you came in at a key time because uh, it was coming off a tough season, right? Yeah, it was. We didn't have any depth because of the recruiting in the past. So we went out and we worked really, really hard that year. And after that 2-8 and eight season, we won our last game against Tulsa to go 2-8, and eight, by the way. We had an eight-game losing streak. But we recruited hard, and I thought we got – the nucleus of what was to become a, a great run, like you said, for, for Bill Yeoman. I think he's remembered by that five years more than, even though he had great years, he was uh, remembered for that little four or five years run uh, that, that kind of set his legacy in stone there. And it kind of led up to that 1977 Cotton Bowl that we were just talking about with A. Lois that season. What a great season that was. Explain to people what happened that year. And A. Lois talked about the, the University of Texas game. Maybe you can get into that win and, and what a big deal that was. The thing that sticks out to me, Robert, is that we did not have one lost time injury the entire year in 1976, okay, until a minute and 30 seconds left in the Cotton Bowl in the fourth quarter when Melvin Jones, one of the freshmen that we had recruited after that 2-8 season, prayed All-American from Klein High School, uh, uh, hurt his knee, and and it was it, it had to happen because we had no depth. We had freshmen and, uh, and a lot of the spaces uh, for the second team and stuff and all that deal, whatever. So keeping our veterans on the field was it just had to happen for us to to win, and and we did. And uh, we lost one conference game against Arkansas and Rice Stadium, fourteen to seven, I think, and uh, and uh, we got beat by. Uh, in the non-conference one time, I think we were ended up 10-2. and two. We beat the undefeated team, Maryland Cotton Bowl. But the two games that stick out uh, was the A&M game and the Texas game. Because it was the first time we were playing them in the Southwest Conference, and they were both loaded. And I knew what A&M had because I had, you know, helped Emory Blard as a, as a businessman kind of recruit and everything before coming over to the University of Houston. So I'm there, and I'll never forget this as long as I live and everything. We're in the locker room at Rice. And the reason we played at Rice, a lot of people don't know, we played 10 road games that year. 
the conference not only made us wait four years before we got in the conference, but they allowed the, the visiting people coming in to not play in the Astrodome, to play in Rice. They had their choice what they wanted. Of course, A&M, Arkansas, and, you know, they played at Rice Stadium. OK, so so they wanted to get us out of home and everything like that. So we were really on the road 10 games. So anyway, we're playing. We're in that locker room. And of course, he knew I was an a graduate and everything. And then Coach Elman kiddingly comes over and he says, he says, how are you doing, big fella? That's what he used to call me and everything like that. I said, well, hell, Coach, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? <laughs> That's more important. <laughs> you got to call the plays. And he, he said, well, I'm just worried about you and everything like that. Whatever. You, you ain't got any problems here tonight, do you? I said, you mean pulling for him? No, I don't think so. I said, I'm, I said that make my job harder. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we're done. We need to go out there and do it. I don't just don't know how we're going to do it because I know those players over there. They're pretty good. He said, he looked down at me and he said, Butch, he said, let me tell you something. He said, don't you ever worry about the red and white. He said, the red and white will go out there and give them everything they need and everything like that. There won't be an easy moment out there. Trust me. I said, all right, coach, I'm with you. Let's go and everything. And, of course, we go out there, and and, um, they had stolen the defensive coordinator, his defensive coordinator the year before, Melvin Robertson, and he was leading the defense of A&M against Houston. He, and he knew Houston and Billy Oman as well as anybody. But, but we beat them 21 to 10 in front of 70,000 people. Another thing later in the year was playing the University of Texas. And, of course, me being an Aggie, that was a huge game for me. And it was a huge game for everybody. No, nobody's arguing that. That's the first game we played them over in Memorial Stadium. And Darrell Royal and the Texas Longhorns had a 42 game home streak, winning streak. And I'll never forget the day before when we walked, we had a practice walk over in the stadium for the kids. And they were all in dress clothes and everything. We're walking around there, whatever. And he let them walk around and, and walk the field and, and ask to see how the turf was and all that kind of stuff, whatever. And then he got, gets us all together before we get back on the bus. And I'll never forget this talk as long as I live. I've used various, various of it when I coached later. And he said, guys, he says, I want you to look up here in these stands. I want you to look around. Look all the way around. Turn your head. Look all around. There are going to be 77,000 people here tomorrow, and they're not going to be pulling for you. And he said, let me tell you that right now. you got to understand that. They're going to have the big band and the noise and the music and all that kind of deal, whatever. And I said, I want you to look at all these stands. Look, look at all these seats up here. It's amazing. You'll never play in something like this again. He said, look at this. He said, but let me tell you something. There's never been a seat in a football stadium that ever made a tackle or ever scored a touchdown. And not only that, the people that sit in these seats tomorrow, they've never scored a touchdown or they've never made a tackle. This game will be decided on the field that you're standing on right now got nothing to do with these people okay and let me tell you right now i'm gonna put the pressure on you right now you're better than they are you're a better team than they are regardless what these people think so tomorrow you look around when we're walking out of here tomorrow when you come in here don't you even look up there you keep your focus on the field and that was the last thing he said and he started walking out the gate and everything. Everybody followed him out, got on the buses, and went back to the hotel. I'm going to promise you, everybody slept better that night because of that, that talk that he gave. He got up the next day in the afternoon. We go out there. 42-game winning streak, home winning streak. We beat those people 30 to nothing on their field. In the fourth quarter, there wasn't half the people left in those seats that he was talking about the day before. And one of the greatest wins of all time. And, of course, after that, it was over. Daryl Royal called Frank Brawls after that game that night and said, we we need to leave coaching, we need to go in the deal. Because he knew he couldn't control the recruiting like he had had for the years before. And so Frank Brawls and Daryl Royal, you know, retired from coaching and kept their athletic directorship for years to come after that and everything, but that was the game that decided that, okay? So there's pivotal moments in, in life and learning experiences in life, and Bill Yeoman was a great teacher, and I'll never forget that as long as I live. Those two things, the A&M game in the locker room with me and the talk that he had with his players before we played the University of Texas the day before, you know, and everything, those are two things that stand out in my mind. There's several others, but – those are two things that I think 
people, you know, that you can't tell by the scoreboard and you can't tell, you know, by the yards and the beer and all that stuff, all that kind of deal, whatever. He, he had an impact on kids when he talked. Yeah, you said it perfectly, and it seems like it, it, it just happened yesterday. That it's, it's that memorable to you. What do you feel like about his personality helped him connect with both players and coaches on a, on a day-to-day basis? Because you're talking about, you know, pregame speech or whatever, but what was it about him on a day-to-day basis that, that made him connect with people? I mean, this guy was a genius offensively, and he was just so smart. He had a brother that was a doctor and, he had, you know, and everything. And so I think the development of the players – and, and the way he did his, ran his practices and did his thing endeared him to the players. And I'll give you an example. The great quarterback that led the two Cotton Bowl wins was Danny Davis. He was recruited as Danny Jones, okay, from Dallas Carter High School. And it got between Arkansas and the University of Houston because Arkansas wanted to make him the first black quarterback ever at Arkansas. And it was a fight down to the end. And so we signed Danny Jones. Now, later – he changes his name to Danny Davis because his mother, you know, married again. And, and Mr. Davis was a minister. And today Danny Davis is a pastor down here in Houston, one of the largest churches down here in Houston and everything like that. Tremendous, tremendous guy. Danny hurt his knee and he had a red shirt and everything. And, and which was good for us. His first year back was a sophomore year when we beat Maryland in the Cotton Bowl. Okay. And so during that stage of a practice from the beginning and spring practice before and everything, uh, Danny didn't have a, didn't have a strong throwing arm. And so Coach Yeoman would go out there every day in the fall, you know, he, he, before we played and everything, he's throwing him every day. I mean, a ton. I mean, just got every day to where Danny had to come in the training booth and everything. And, and with Tom Wilson and everything, they had to put ice on his elbow and his elbow was all swollen up every day and everything. And then come back out the next day and he'd throw again. I mean, unbelievable. Just, just it's God. And, I, and I'm a baseball player and I know about pitching and things like that, whatever. And, and I was kind of a bold kid. And so I, I, I got into the side. I said, Coach, I'll talk to you a minute. I said, Coach, I said, you know, I got a baseball background. And I mean, you know, I don't want to, I mean, it's your deal, you know, but God, he says, I go in there after practice and I see Coach, you know, Tom Wilson. Ice him up with ace bandage and everything, and he goes home at night. And he comes back out, and his old elbow swollen up. And then you're out there and you throwing him like crazy again, and everything like that. Whatever. I said, you you don't have any fear ever of hurting his arm, do you? <laughs> and he looked at me. He said, "You think I'm throwing him too much?" <laughs> and I said, I, "You know, he ain't laughing." You know. <laughs> I, I said, "Well, coach," I said, "You know, I." I I don't know. I mean, you know, you know that guy. He looked at me. He said, "He says, he says, I'll handle this, big fellow." Okay. He says, "I'll handle it." <laughs> and I said, "Okay, all right, no problem." And all I did, whatever. Of course, later on, Danny Davis. You know, uh, there ain't too many people in this state won two cotton balls. You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So you know, it was just you know, but but it, he was just very confident. It, it knew what he did, but he didn't. He didn't mind that. He didn't. He didn't ever get mad at me. He'd always come get me to go play. The racquetball with him, and so he didn't ever—he didn't take it personally or anything like that. He kind of liked it. I got him to the side. I did it professionally, but gee, but I couldn't believe it. So, so, so I learned, you know, I learned, and other people that that you know, development was the deal and everything, and 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 uh, and and he was unbelievable at it. I mean, you know, I, he was he was he was like I said, he was a genius offensively. He, was, he called every play. Nobody ever called a play at the University of except Bill Yeoman. And being inside an offensive meeting. Okay, right. I mean, to listen to the detail of of what he was doing after he watched film and, and on the other team and did the stuff and whatever, and then also halftime adjust, adjustments. He would watch the game, and when he would come in the locker room, he wouldn't talk to the quarterback, he wouldn't talk to the running back, he wouldn't talk to the defense. He would. He got the five offensive starting linemen, went into a room with them and found out what the defensive line was doing, okay? Mm-hmm. they causing them problems and things like that, and then would come out in the second half and everything with a plan to overcome that and all that kind of deal, whatever and all that. He was, he was, he was, he was absolute genius. He no doubt, doubt about it. You were talking a little bit about how serious he was and you think of a college coach and they're fierce and tough and all that, but one of the things that Lois was saying and – it, it kind of surprised me was, and I think Tom mentioned as well that he's he was a funny guy. Do you, do you remember anything that uh, he did that made you laugh, or you know what what part of that do you remember from him? When he was serious, you knew it. Okay, ain't no doubt about that. But he was friendly, and he did a great job on the TV programs and the 
in the interviews. And I mean, he was, he was a friendly guy, you know, that's him. But when, when he was, when he had his kids and, and his coaches in a group and everything like that, and, 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 you know, you didn't have to worry about when he was serious or not. He was, but, but yes, he had a great personality. He, he couldn't have got the beautiful AJ Yeoman to marry him if he wasn't, didn't have some kind of personality. Cause that was the key to his deal. I mean, I'm going to tell you, his wife was, she was nails. I mean, she was, she was a rock solid lady. I mean, I'm a, a class. I mean, just awesome deal. I mean, he married above himself. I'm going to tell you that right now. She was a tremendous woman. Okay. Really, really was a great, just a great person to be with. Okay. And, and let him, I'm sure it kept him from many mistakes. I mean, she was a class lady, boy. She really was. She, she was something else. But it, but anyway, he he was no, he was always no, he was good. He joked, he friendly, and all that kind of deal, whatever. But you knew when he stepped across that line, it was serious business, or in the practice field, even. even. Final memory, just uh, the Bill Yeoman that you got to know personally. You know, what what are you going to tell people? What are you going to tell kids, grandkids, uh, people a part of the U of H program? Who was Bill Yeoman? I mean, the class act. I mean, he told me one time, I'll give you a great example. He, he told me one time, I said, coach, I said, you know, we're riding in the car, we're recruiting, we were up in Fort Worth and he wanted to go with me. Okay. We were, I was going to Arlington Martin to watch a defensive back. Cause when I went on the road, I always found a game there that I could go on Friday night and everything like that, whatever. And I could go before the game on Saturday. So anyway, we sit up there and everything. We go to the game. And of course, I'm honored to have him. I'm walking the ballpark with Bill Hillman. Hell, that's all the deal, you know? And at halftime, at halftime, this kid comes out from the locker room and he escorts, it was homecoming and he escorts one, one of the girls out at halftime. I mean, it's rare, but it's not, it's done. Okay. I've seen it before everything, but he was a black kid escorting a white girl. Okay. And, and back, you know, it's back in the day. I mean, it's back in the seventies, it wasn't the sixties, but it was, you know, that kind of thing. And so and everything, and I'll never forget it. He turned to me and he says, look at that. He says, is that great or what? And I looked at him, you know, I said, what are you talking about? He, he said, he says, that black football player came out of the locker room to escort that white girl and everything, everything. It's your girlfriend and everything, did the deal, whatever. He said, isn't, isn't, is that awesome or what? That gives you a little bit of insight on that man's thinking way ahead of time compared to other people. Way ahead of time, coach. Okay. And everything like that. I just thought to myself right then, and I was young, I thought to myself, you know, this guy gets it. This guy really, really gets it. Yeah, great bridge to what's going on today as well. And I can't thank you enough for for doing this and remembering your friend and you know somebody that I know meant so much to you in your life. Well, I hope it helps. He was a great leader, one of the mentors of my life. I've had many in business and in, in coaching and all that deal, whatever. But uh, there's no question he has a long and enduring career, and there, he earned that statue that's out there. I can tell you that in front of University of Houston. He had a great run and everything. Great family and everything like that. Good man. And like I said, he married one of the jewels in the in the world. She was from Bryan, Texas, by the way. I don't know if we met her when he was at a or not, but A.J. Yeoman was, uh, they ought to have a statue of her right by him. And she was a tremendous lady. <laughs> All right. I want to leave everybody with a couple of words from Bill Yeoman himself. But first, here's one of the best moments in Coach Yeoman's career. It's the last second game-winning touchdown in the 1980 Cotton Bowl when the Cougars beat the seventh-ranked Nebraska Cornhuskers, let's pick it up fourth and one on Nebraska's six-yard line with 19 seconds left. Elston over the middle. It is caught for a touchdown. Perry caught the deflection for the touchdown. All flex. He went to Perry Perry just like Bill Young called it. No, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a great, great experience to be with these kids. And, of course, on something like this, when you see that they have really – really worked exceptionally hard. They committed themselves to trying to get better and to be good. And then when a few things kind of drop in and, and they say, you know, maybe this is the way to go, is to do right and, and work real hard. And of course, that's what we're, you're trying to get across to them anyway. And then when it, that works out, so they say, well, by golly, you know, maybe there's something to this. Nobody's had more fun in his life than I have. And, and it's because I was here at the University of Houston. I'm serious. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Don't forget to follow Houston Sports Talk on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Podcast app, or the Stitcher app. You can support us by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or by telling your friends about us. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.